Hey, what's good, people? This is episode 72. And this is Sports Debate Tuesday. It's my boy Rob McLean. 72. The episode starts right now. Well, that was nice and silent. <laughs> Guess who's back? Back again. It's me. It's me, the JCD, Jason Christopher DeBellius. I'm your host with the most, and that is my co-host. That is Rob. Keep it. McLean. McLean, this is episode 72, Sports Debate Tuesday. What's good, bro? What's happening, my man? Yes, we're going to talk about the two sports that Meryl Streep hates the most, football and mixed martial arts, which, by the way, is not an art. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. Um, so, <laughs> um, all right, so starting with football. We got a lot to talk about. UFC just happened over the weekend. That's MMA. We got a uh, quick basketball question. Baseball, the wild cards heating up. Just want that we're going to do that on a quick question. But first things first, Rob, uh, we got the NFL. We got week three. It's in the books, and there are only four undefeated teams remaining. Some we might have expected, and some were just some, just literally can't. I mean, figuratively, metaphorically, came out of the blue. Um, and those undefeated teams are the Raiders, they are the Broncos, they're the Rams, and they are the Cardinals. So, Rob, our question is twofold: Which team? Which one of those three and O teams were the biggest surprise to you? And and at the end, where the question is, which zero and three team has been the biggest disappointment? So I'll let you go first. The floor is yours, Rob. The question is, which team out of those four undefeated teams is the biggest surprise? I mean, <clears throat> I think they're all very surprising. You know, you look at the Rams, the Cardinals. Uh, that's that's pretty surprising that they're three and zero. But I mean, it's good teams. Uh, the Raiders, very surprising. They're three and zero. They've had pretty up and down years the last five years, um, but I think it's the Broncos. I mean, if you look at what they had coming into the year, you wouldn't think that they would be somewhat of a staple of consistency over the first three games. But you know, they played good football. They haven't played. You know, they play good football. You know, just give them that. And uh, their defense looks solid again. Um, they have some sort of an offense, <laughs> uh, just some sort of an offense. To piggyback on that defense, and yeah, it's uh, it's just good football they're playing. So, I think it's the most surprising, but uh, I don't think it'll stay. You know, I think uh, of those teams, I think the Raiders is actually the best of those four teams. Uh, you know, on both sides of the ball. So, we'll see what happens towards the end of the year. But I think uh, the Raiders are here to stay. You know. I'd like to say I'm one of those people that are neck deep in football, and I am neck deep in football. And sometimes when you veer away from football, one of those things that keep you in are fantasy. You know, if you're part of two leagues, you start keeping track of, of players that are outside of your market, that are outside of your, your, the team you love, which for me is, hey, 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 <laughs> let's go, Buffalo. Beat the brakes off of Washington. So I got to get that one in. And congratulations to them that are 2-0, except that big old hiccup they had against Pittsburgh. So... And it's weird because if you stay, if you veer too far from away, away from football, Rob, you might ask the question, who's the starting quarterback for the Denver Broncos? It's like, I don't fucking know. <laughs> Teddy Bridgewater doing his thing. By far, by far the biggest surprise three and we do, I mean, they had some teams that they that if they are what people think they are, they were supposed to be. And you still have to play those games. You still have to beat them. So to me, they're the biggest surprise. The Raiders, when they beat the Ravens last minute and when they beat uh, um, got this other team last minute last week, I was like, I wouldn't be surprised if they're 3-0. So as an overall general surprise, yeah, you you expected them to whatever. The Rams, you're, you definitely expect them to be 2-1 and one because we didn't think there's anyone that was going to stop the Bucks. However... We did. We did agree that if there was one team that could, that that kind of that that had the formula that had people that could get to the quarterback, which is what they did, right? I mean, we'll talk about that a little bit if you want. Mm -hmm. um, Brady, through his reputation, if you get to him, he might see a couple of ghosts. You know what I'm saying? He might. Um, he doesn't tap in the and he doesn't tap dance in the pocket like Aaron, Aaron Rodgers or like the late great Gregory Hines, but we. 
weren't totally surprised because we knew if we, they could beat the Bucks, they would be three and zero. You know, um, I got to give it to the Raiders. I mean, I got to give. Sorry, excuse me. I got to give it to the Broncos. I, I I can't even. We can't even name five people on our team. You know, they've they've done so so much revamping. Even Joe Flacco is coming in and out in and out of there. They haven't had a good quarterback since um, John Elway, right? They had um, Jay Cutler. They had. Orton, they had Tim Tebow for Christ's sakes. They, 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 right? Who's the last decent quarterback to come out of there? It could be, it could be Bridgewater. I mean, Bridgewater, right? He's been injured and he hasn't really gotten a complete fair shake on some of these teams. But every time we see him play, what has he done? He's done nothing but win. You know, he's he's, he's, he's Tim Tebow with the, with the right throwing technique. And like Skip Baylor said, all he does is win. <laughs> all he does is win. Oh, all he does is win. So make mine the Broncos, which leads me to the next question, Rob. Um, which 0-3 team was the biggest disappointment? Um, I'm going to veer from the obvious. I'll go first on this one because I think we were about to say the same thing, but then I had to give it to someone else. I'm going Detroit Lions. I think they're the best 0-3 team in the league right now. I thought they've, they, even the games they lost, they competed really, really hard. And they're suffering from something which I affectionately refer to as Lions luck. Right. I, I mean, you, you got someone that's going that's trying to kick the piss out of the ball 66 yards, which is a record. Right. It, you're hoping it falls short and it did kind of fall short. It hit the freaking crossbar. Right. But it hits the crossbar and goes in that, my friend, is Lions luck. But not to mention that there was um, a delay of game that the referees, the referees didn't see the clock hit zero. There was a, the play before that. The play before that that put them in that field position, uh, there was a delay of game, which would which would have cost them five yards, which would have changed the whole scenario of sixty six yard field goal to hail Mary, possibly possibly fail Mary. Um, you think about what's happened over the years with this team, right? They, um, I remember Aaron Rodgers throwing a hail Mary bomb, but people forget that there was this bullshit roughing the passer penalty, which gave him 15 yards, which put him in that position. We remember Calvin Johnson catching a ball and then on some kind of roll, the way he patted the ball down, they called it an incomplete pass. This team has been so jinxed and so snake bitten that the best players, some of the most dominant players to play the game, retired early, right? Barry Sanders. I'm like, he's like, I'm not going to be banging myself out. I'm going to leave my reputation here. Boom. Calvin Johnson, you know, concussions were the issue, but one of the most dominant. Right, we agree? Megatron? That, that guy can do things that, that oh my goodness. And and I find myself rooting for them. They are the ultimate underdogs. And now I'm just, now I'm hoping they win games, except against my Buffalo Bills, of course. So I go Detroit Lions. Who you got, Rob? Who's the most disappointed 0-3 team for you? Uh, I mean... You know, personally, the Giants, but that's just, you know, they, we already knew that was going to happen. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, man, I have to go with Detroit because, like you said, man, I mean, they've had a lot of really good games. You know, they played really tough first week against the Ravens, uh, and then they played a, a really tough game last week, and, and they literally were up most of the game, and then they lost to a 66-yard field goal. You know, like that's that's just, that's just rough, you know. Um, I'm sorry, the Rams first week. So, like – it's just like, dang, man, they, they got a tough schedule, easy games. Maybe they got, uh, you know, they got some, some, you know, good luck all the way to the end. And then literally, you know, a, a, a record field goal from 66 yards. You know how far that is? That's behind the 50-yard line. That's- There's a reason why I picked this guy fifth in my fantasy. Everybody's like, you don't know what the hell you're doing. My man came up with 17 points. Sorry, go ahead. No, it's just, yeah. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, with, uh, I'm with you on that on Detroit Lions as well. Yeah, but let's talk about that other team that w- that we would have picked. The Giants up a whole touchdown, get this ridiculous penalty on third down, which if they held it down and didn't get the penalty, they'd have the other team would have to kick a field goal instead. It's a tie game and instead, you know, you you allow this window for for um for Ryan and the Falcons to kick this field goal as the clock expired, mm-hmm. which is I think subsequently how they lost last week if I remember right. They lost mm-hmm. by a field goal. And you and I are officially done picking them. Right. I remember us saying that last week. Like if they don't win this one, gotcha. we're kinda we're kinda done with them. Um are we done with New York teams? This is the third consecutive season. This is the third consecutive season, I believe, that they both finish 0 and three. You know, it's like I mean, this, we're this gonna like pick what no we gonna pick, dude. you know. Hmm? The games are the games, but you know, it's just gonna be difficult to pick New York or, you know, the Giants when they have, you know, at best mediocre quarterback play and and average yeah. defense so yep you can't win that way well the rookies right now are a one in ten their their win loss record for all first year quarterbacks which i think 
for old school virtue, that's the way it's supposed to be, right? In fact, the one win uh, uh, was against another rookie, I believe. I, I think, um, um, I can't remember the, the, the name, but the two teams had rookie quarterbacks playing each other and one one had to win. Oh, it was Mac Jones. Mac Jones beating Zach, Zach right. Wilson. What the hell were the Jets thinking about? Well, I didn't, didn't I warn you? Didn't I tell you that 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 is a pick that left me scratching my head with all of those options? You know, but then again, I wouldn't want Justin Fields or Mac Jones or any or Trevor Lawrence or any decent quarterback to for, to have their career die with the New York Jets. Talk about snake bitten, dude. Um, yeah. So let's um we're not closing the door on football because football we're seeping into topic two. We're gonna go really quick to um the pick six. Um, Rob, we had a pick six with Taylor Crab, and let's put his picture up. Do I have his picture? Come on, boy. Where you at? There he is. The dirty white boy was three and three. Rob, you were three and three. You went with the Eagles, and I am four and two. <laughs> and um, I guess that leaves the guest at. 12 and 6 that leaves me at 11 and 7 and that leads you at um 9 and 9 so those those are the standing for this week but yesterday's gone sweet jesus <laughs> and tomorrow may never be mine so here we go let's go pick six let's go game one let's go panthers at the dallas cowboys the undefeated panthers wait did they lose i wonder yeah they lost they're two and one yeah who you got? Um, <laughs> I'll probably go with the uh, with the Panthers. I like what they're doing. Yeah, I might go with the Cowboys. Um, I think both teams were pretty fortunate to be two and one. Particularly the Dallas Cowboys. They were an illegal procedure penalty from the Chargers from from not winning that game. Not to mention on um, this obscure rule about forward progress being stopped on the throwaway. Remember we talked about that last week. You like that? I don't. Um, but. Um, not letting my personal bias against the, the team whose fans I despise the most affect my critical thinking skills. I'll go with the Cowboys. Um, let's go Browns at Vikings. Hmm. Uh, hmm. I'm going to go with the Browns on this one. They, they, they've been kind of crushing it recently. I'm going to go Cleveland Browns, too. I'm actually surprised at 3-0, and my my old man memory doesn't even remind me who they even lost to. They, they, they play really good football. Nine sacks last week. Miles Garrett is a problem. Jadavian Clowney has been feeding off of him, and I uh, expect him to see more of the same against Cousins, who I don't think they're doing a great job protecting. Um, so that's a big RJ right there. Uh, game three, Rob. Let's go Lions versus the Bears. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sorry I'm, I'm laughing I read with, your mind <laughs> I mean honestly I feel like the, the, the Lions win this game but I'm going to go with the I'm going to go with the Lions yeah I'm going to go with the Lions I like, I like that I think I'm going to go with the Lions too and I think the score is going to be in a manner where they, they don't put themselves in a position to be screwed um, I think that they, if they continue to start Justin Fields, they're probably going to lose more games, but it's super necessary to know if that's your guy. And the man's got, just like Peyton Manning his first year and so many first year, so many rookies that put in and lost a bunch of games and came back, you got you to gotta let this guy take his lumps. And I like that Nagy's doing it. He's been highly criticized for the play calling, but I don't think we, we witnessed a complete act. But until then, until then, Rob, I'm going to go with the Detroit Lions myself. Um, game four, Cardinals versus the Rams. This is, I'll go first on this one. Somebody's O has to go. We got um, Kyler Murray just playing out of his mind. That receiving core, uh, if, if A.J. Green's on the end of the depth chart, that is a deep, deep team. And um, Ramsey, man, I mean, Ramsey might be left all out there by himself unless they can get pressure on Kyler Murray, and I, and I don't think they will. I think he's mobile, and I think they run plays that keep him moving away from where the defense is, and I go for the visiting Cardinals to upset the, um, I believe, one of the NFC favorite uh, Rams. I think this is this is the game the Rams lose. I don't, I don't know. I don't think I see the Rams losing this game, even though I, I think I probably should pick the Cardinals because the Cardinals usually make tough games, tough games. Mm -hmm. um, they don't, you know, blow out people and they don't, um, you know, kind of like, you know, just lay down for others. So it's going to be a close game. 
I'm not gonna pick a point spread on it, but I, <laughs> I still don't know. I still don't think the uh, the Cardinals are gonna uh, pull this ball out. But, but but you know, we'll see. So I'm gonna have to go against the Cardinals on this one. You got the Rams. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, game five, you're going to go first on this one. We have the Baltimore Ravens visiting the undefeated Broncos. Will, will this be the Broncos' first loss against a quality opponent, or will the Broncos fly mile high as the host? I think the Broncos are going to win. I don't like what the Ravens are doing. You know, their offense should be a lot more explosive. You know, they're at times explosive, but they're not overall explosive. Their defense is not good enough to hold up for that. I just think they're going to start falling apart, the Ravens. I don't like what they're doing, so I'm going to have to go against them. You know, I um, I don't know what the line is on us, but I wouldn't be surprised to see the home team that's undefeated be the underdog on this one. But I think you see something that, that a lot of people who presume that they're the underdog don't, don't see right now. And I, uh, I have everything... As far as logic is concerned, says it goes with the Broncos, but my gut, my my gut tells me the Ravens are going to do, it, and I'm going to go with my gut on this one. I'm going to go Baltimore. I think um, Lamar Jackson Jackson creates a lot of creates some plays. I think I think Tucker, if he can kick a 66 yard field goal, <laughs> you know, in Detroit, man, watch that ball just fly in that mile high wind. <laughs> he might do one from 70 and break his own record. He is he the goat right now for kickers. The guy's had so many clutch kicks, and he's hit like I think twenty nine in a row. And really, all um, he had, to, all he had to do was like break the record. You know? No, no, he's not. No, no. Adam Vinatieri. Oh or yeah, Captain what's Clutch. His name? Yeah, you can't even. He should have. Honestly, there, no one wants to give a Super Bowl MVP to a kicker, but there were definitely two instances where you you wouldn't. No one would have kicked up too much of a fuss. Um, yeah. I think you're right. I think let's continue to to let this guy's story be written, and maybe when it's done, maybe we'll have that conversation again. But really hard to do with an active player when someone's already accomplished so much, you know. And, and his longevity was uncanny, right? He played till he was what? I don't. I mean, we don't even know how old. Fifty. What yeah. the hell, man? How many fifty? year olds out you see out there just doing shit <laughs> you know <laughs> me um <laughs> last one pick six we're gonna go raiders at the chargers undefeated raiders the chargers again on an illegal procedure away from being three and oh themselves it's gonna come down to the last play um, against two evenly matched teams, very good defense, very very well coached. I thought they were well coached last the last year before this dude got fired, Coach Johnson. Um, but I think if it's going to be that close, I go with the home team. I go with the Chargers. Huh. I uh, I don't know, man. I just think it's uh, this Gruden train has finally gotten on the tracks. Um, I mean, Chucky Max Ball, Crosby, boy. who who is that? <laughs> you know, like, uh, I mean, they have players that they've developed. They have players. So I think they're just playing their brand of ball. Derek Carr is probably the most underrated player in the league right now. Um, and, yeah, I think this is kind of just their time to, to show what they're made of. I don't think that a Gruden team is going to be unprepared. I don't think they're going to be, uh, you know, mentally not ready or you know pl playing at their best level i think that's just it just took time you know to create that atmosphere so for me i'm gonna go with the raiders and i think it's their time to kind of show what they're made of that's crazy i think let me tell you something about uh elite athletes at that level um if some people doesn't don't like playing with a coach most of the time they'll just keep their mouth shut. They won't come out and, and throw their coach under the bus, though there are some divas that do that. But if a player likes his coach, they're very open about it. So if they like their coach, they're open. And if they're not, they just they just keep it to themselves. There are so many people that say openly how much they enjoy playing for this guy. You know, um, it's very, it's very, very Rex Ryan esque where he kind of lets the players do their thing as long as they keep their promises professional. It's like this unsigned contract. If you behave like an adult, I'm not going to treat you like kids. Deal, handshake, handshake, got it. And I think that's what's going on there. And well, at that, at that level, at the professional level, I think that's where professionals are at their best. You kind of let them be themselves, and 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 if they are what they say they are, right? 
um, they put pressure on themselves. They they very much like the Tampa Bay Bucks, very much like the Rams. You know, very well coached team. I think a lot of people have a lot a lot of nice things to say about that guy. He's that guy's voice sounds like he gargles with razor blades, but that's a whole other story, right? It sounds like freaking um, Hawk from the Road Warriors. You know, well, <laughs> it seems to be. Um, <laughs> or remember, um, who's that basketball player, Avery Johnson? Remember that that mm-hmm. that that short guy? Sound, you know, he has that voice, and, and Chris Childs. Chris Childs did a great impersonation. So you guys look at that up on YouTube. It's hilarious. Uh, okay, we're closing the door on football uh, for now, and we're going straight to mixed martial arts. We're going straight to the UFC. We're going straight to UFC 266, the pay per view. Um, Alexander Volkanovsky successfully defended his featherweight title. Um, that's 20 wins in a row. He came in with 19 wins in a row. Um, Ortega. Fought like a champ, dude. You know, if it were anybody else, maybe maybe he comes out of that. Maybe maybe save Max because that, that seemed like a similar fight that he had with Max Holloway. Um, he took it as far as it can go, and he fell short. And it is what it is. So, congratulations to the champ successfully defending his title. So congratulations to Valentina Shevchenko just just constantly doing her thing. Um, also, in our pick six, you were a, a, a magnificent five and one. You, you, the only one you picked wrong was Rosen, Rosen Strike and um, Curtis Blades. Um, I think Blades took what the last two rounds or something like that. I was three and three, and our girl Tanisa Sri, also known as Tin, our, our, she was our little hottie. She was three and three as well. So Rob, congratulations, dominant fashion. Um, and Ro- honestly, Rosen Strike wasn't wasn't a bad pick. He, the guy, every fight is. I mean. Right, the other guy, um, Blaze is a good grappler, but every round starts standing. So you, I mean, right? Did so. you see his face? Yeah. <laughs> did you see Curtis Blaze's face? Yeah, he didn't look like a fight? winner, did he? <laughs> oh, no. Right, he didn't look oh, like a winner. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that was a uh, pretty extra there. Ah. I'd say five round <laughs> fights for top five fighters. That's what I say. There it is, my man. So, I guess the topic question, my man, is. Let's have a little fun. The two questions are twofold. Which fight entertained you the most? And um, the second question is, uh, what's next for the defending champs? Um, I mean, I just can go with the, the defending champs first, honestly. But let's do um, that. What's what's next for what's next for Volkanovski and what's next for um, yeah. Valentina Shevchenko? I mean, Volkanovski, I think, uh, yeah, we could always do the, the, um, the, Orte- uh, the, not the Ortega, the Holloway fight again. But um, I want to see Yair Rodriguez. I think he is a really explosive, just X Factor type fighter. Uh, you, you think he, you know, he gets hit with a shot and he'll, he's going to fold, but he kind of reminds me of like a, a smaller division Charlos Oliveira, you know, where. He can kind of do everything, mm-hmm. but he's he's dangerous somewhere, you know, and he's dangerous on his feet. You know, he's got a lot of creativity. He's got a lot of uh, um, different views and different different angles that a lot of people aren't used to. Um, and I think he would cause a lot of problems for Volkanovski. Um, so that's what I would like to see for the next fight. I mean, we could talk about him going to different divisions and fighting different guys, but I think uh, if you're looking within the division for another fight, that's it's right there. Um, and then when you got uh, Shevchenko, um, yeah, they say the the Andrade again. I don't like that. I just want them to go straight to uh, straight to uh, uh, Nunez and, and and get it rolling again. Because at the end of the day, um, I think they could fight five times and just call it a career, you know. And then you know get this question over with, you know. First two fights were kind of toss ups. The last one, again, a toss-up. You got to fight again and figure it out. You know, that's what great fighters do. They, they, they prove who's the best fighter in the room. You know, if there's still a doubt in question, fight again. Let's do it. You know, and honestly, I believe every single fight has been in question. Neither one of them has knocked each other out or submitted each other or done anything to put each other in danger. You know, mm. I, I, you know, that's, uh, 
I'm, well, I'm glad. Fight. I think it should have been a draw each time, honestly. Uh, I think it should have yeah. been a draw. I thought the first one should have been a draw. I thought Valentina um, had a 10-8 round the third round. I thought Amanda ran out of gas. It was a three-round fight. Uh, but the second time, I thought Amanda won 48-47. I thought the judges got that right. But like you said, Riza, 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 close. Riza, 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 sharp. Yeah, Valentina, Shevchenko, um, Amanda Nunez. Uh, Jessica Andrade looked really, really bit good in her, her fight against uh, a well-rounded fighter and Cynthia Cavillo. But um, with respect to her, Shevchenko doesn't know her a damn thing, you know? And I think Amanda Nunez really owes, I would think she really owes Shevchenko this match, this last match. I mean, when you beat someone twice, you usually don't own a thing, but it's that close and it's that interesting. And, and you rarely see two, two people become a rival when one person decision wise or, or wins loss wise has been, been dominant very much like the Yankees and Mets. Like we, the, I mean, the Yankees in Boston, they weren't our rival until 2004 because we've been beating them. We, they, I mean, we were theirs and then good for them, but, um, yeah, that's the one I, I want to see run back. I want to see uh, a champion versus champion. I want to see Amanda fight at 135. I want to see Shevchenko be, you know, move up, which she, we, we both know she can easily do. She's she's very professional because she gains her weight and loses her weight through training. You never see that girl on a, um, trying to suck herself dry on the way in. She just looks terrific. She looks like she's in a good mood. She looks like she could do that little twisty dance that she likes to do. Um, and, yeah, make mine um, Amanda Nunez against Shevchenko for uh, Volkanovski. Um, I'd like to see that, that, that I'd like to see a loser leaves town, uh, a loser leaves the weight class against Max Holloway. I want to see that one more time because I really love the way they went after each other though. And in tr that Yair Rodriguez fight is intriguing as hell. This, Yair was so young going against ridiculous competition at such an early, early stage, you know? And, you know, Frankie Edgar, he was unable to continue that fight, but he was down the fight. You know, Frankie Frankie lumped him up. Um, uh, Korean Zombie, and you know, that last 10 seconds, the spinning up elbow, we will never, we've never seen that before at, in that fashion, the spinning spinning elbow upward. And we'll probably never see that again unless it's done by yeah. Rodriguez. So I wouldn't fuss and fight or scratch and kick and bite about that one either. But I'd like to see Volkanovski um, um, run that back with Max Holloway one more time. I, um, and with that being said, my uh, the match that entertained me the most, um, I'm going to put him up again because this is a great card, dude. This is a great card where everyone delivered. Um, uh, I really, let's big up to Lauren Murphy. We knew, sorry, we knew she wasn't going to win that match, but we knew that girl could take a, could take a punch and we knew that she can withstand a lot of punishment because we knew she wanted it in a bad way. But Rob, um, give me, Give me someone with a lot of heart. I'll show you have someone I can beat up for an hour straight, and that's what happens. <laughs> let's not let's not forget Marla Morais against Marab uh, Davishvili, um, Dan Hooker, Nazrat. Excellent fight. But I got to give the rub to the people that everyone expected was going to be a barn burner, and that was Nick Diaz and Robbie Lawler. They, they, you, you make this non-title fight with two unranked fighters, a five-round fight. Why? Because we knew that they were going to entertain us if it went all five rounds. And those guys, there was no retreating. There was no like one, two, and then move. Robbie Lawler pushed the pace against a guy who likes to fight in the phone booth. And Nick... Nick really showed how clean his boxing is compared to Nate. Nate gets a little bit loopy sometimes and he leaves his head out there, but Nick is Nick is tight, man. Nick is tight. That was a great fight, dude. For a guy who just rolled uh, I'm not going to say rolled off the couch. That's so disrespectful, but we haven't seen since what? Anderson Silva? That was the last fight Nick Diaz said. You like that? Um I don't. I want to see him in the cage more. Um went to 185, which Lawler um was accommodating because it was supposed to be 170 if you remember. Um then they both agreed last minute to go to 185. And Diaz barely made weight. I think it was 185.5. And the other one was 184.5. So you you could tell you could tell who was keeping their promises and who had to who had to who had to beat themselves up to make the weight. So that's mine. Who's which fight entertained you then, um Saturday night, Rob? Oh, by the way, those wings those wings were slamming from the pitcher house. Those fuck those wings were slamming, dude. Yeah. Lemon pepper, man. Um. Yeah, I mean, it's hard for me to say any other than, uh, I mean, that fight really was the best of the night. I, I felt. Um. I, I mean, 
yeah, the, 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 the main, the main carb was great. I just, you know, it, it was kind of upsetting watching Ortega, um, fight better after he's gotten beaten up, you know, almost on his last leg than he does in the beginning of the fight. You know, if he fought like that from the start, <laughs> it would be a different story, you know, but I feel like, and, and this is to a lot of sports too. Some people see, you know, they perceive it from such a, you know, you lose so much, you can only really start understanding the game or start seeing the game when you lose again, you know? It's like when you're winning, you're almost like, wow, it's, you know, I'm winning. And I feel like that's what Brian Ortega, you know, in these big moments, he's used to getting slapped around, you know, by these kind of higher level guys, you know, and I just don't think he has it out of it. You can see these kind of deer in his headlights. You know, he's got this like weird energy when he's, when he was on, I was looking at him before the fight. Uh, he's got this like, not nervous, but like, it's too intense. You know, the intensity is already around you. Mm -hmm. um, so if you look at him and you look at maybe, let's say, Volkanovski, always look at the guy across the, the cage. You know, he's loose. You know, he's shaking his head. He's getting ready to fight. You know, Brian Ortega, he kind of is actually looking at other people and, and being reactionary. He looks at somebody and he's like, all right, let me get my gloves going. You know, ooh. You know, it's not like he's in his zone and it's not like he's, he's feeling it. So it's almost yeah. like he needs four rounds to get into a zone and get mindless and get into a, a reactionary state. So I don't know. I, I think he just needs more fights. I mean, you can't fight a, a, a title fight, not really, you know, fight one more time against an average opponent and then come back and fight a title fight, you know, against right. Max Holloway and then next one against Volkanovski. That's two of the best fighters that have been in this division. They say Max of all time and then Volkanovski beat Max. So you got a Hall of Famer and then a guy who just beat a Hall of Famer. Those are your two biggest fights. That's in the last your two. Three fights. Yeah, I think you you're know? you're on to something. I think. Look in theater, we always say if you get on that stage to be good, you're not going to be good. But if you go on that stage and 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 you have your action objective and you put that to work, what you practiced and rehearsed, uh, then you'll be good. And we didn't really get to see Brian do that until the knockdown happened. And between you and me, that guillotine, that top position guillotine, that full mount guillotine was tight. Even if you don't get that, how the hell do you get the hell out of full mount? And if then, sacked, and then that, yeah, and then that. Um, well, he's also he's also shaved head, right? And it was sweaty and greasy as hell. <laughs> no, no. I mean, when you get hit for three rounds in the face, you know, and you don't have anything to give back to the other guy, you know, you're tired. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> he's getting punched in the face for three 100%. rounds, and then out of out of nowhere, he gets he catches him. You know, and then falls into a position where he could win the Top fight. Top guillotine. That's and, what then, you, and then that's the what triangle, dude. For. Sorry, go ahead. Right. And that's what you prepare for. But, like, you know, if you don't fight your fight for three rounds and you and you come upon, I mean, that was, it's almost like he failed. It wasn't that, because Volkanovski put himself twice, mm. twice yeah. into right. very vulnerable positions to get a knockout. But he really, because the second time when he got head headlocked, uh, or you got leg locked yeah. uh, on the bottom. That was a tri the triangle too. That was, that was that's, you know, you, you, you don't get out of that. And so <sighs> putting yourself in that situation for a, you know, a knockout, which he really wasn't because after that, he right. went to go knock him out. After that, he went to go do damage, you know? Mm. And so um, clearly he wasn't in the right mind space. So that's why he even got, you, I think everybody saw him setting it up. He's like, why is Volkanovski still in there? Still in why full guard. Why didn't get up? And, Yep. Isn't that like we, we were we were watching a fight together? weren't, weren't you we saying were, like, yeah. like hey, yep. when he was putting the beating on him, and then he and they had top position like a grappling position. I think it was half guard, and you were like, just get up because Ortega has to. If, if Ortega has to get up, he's going to get knocked back down, and the referee sees that. The, it might yeah. entice him to put a stop to a fight because we both agree there were some some instances in that fight that were dangerously close to being stopped. You know, and if and if they did wave it, we, we neither one of us would have had a problem with that because he took a lot of freaking damage, and and then the the Mexican pride in him when the, they were like, "Do you still want to fight? Are you, are you okay to see?" Like I didn't think he could see, and I, and 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 there was definitely a part where he's like, "Man, I'm down four to one, maybe four oh, maybe maybe I should just call it a night." But that dude is a a straight up rough rider. I mean, like you, um, mad respect to both fighters, dude. <sighs> Mad respect to both fighters. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 nothing. That's just, I think Ortega needs to rethink his uh, his career path, and that means take it slow. Stop doing these yeah. freaking title fights and being men's me for people. Yeah. You know, remember, he's, you're, you're he's only... City. Don't, don't let somebody do what they did to Ronda Rousey, which yeah. is take away your best skill and make mm -hmm. you something you are not. 
Right. Brian Ortega is never going to beat Volkanovski on his feet, is never going to beat Max Holloway on his feet. Just like if you took told Khabib to go and fight somebody on his feet, he's not going to win. Because right. the threat of Khabib, the threat of Ortega, is that if you go down to the ground, you have to use your mind to get out of the situation. 100%. But when you're on your feet, it's all right. He don't really know anything. All I got to do is my thing, and I don't even have to worry about that guy. That's So it's very sad to see that somebody is so good at one aspect of the game, but they can't incorporate that into an offensive strategy. It's very, very sad. It's kind of the same thing with Damian Maya. Guy is so good on the ground, but yet you can't just lay on the ground. You know, you got to figure out an offensive strategy to get there, like a Kobe Covington, like a, a Khabib. Use your stand-up to get them in a position to where you can use your best skills on the ground. 100%. But yet Ortega is just getting pieced out on the outside, not trying to clinch, not trying to get close, not trying to – and every time he clinched, he got a takedown. It's true. Every single time. And like you said, so he's yet, got – and like you said, he's got to think about his career. Like those outside of those two fights, he doesn't he the guy doesn't take a lot of damage. No. You know, and he why? comes out of those fights because, clean, clean and handsome. Because you know, you're not gonna take damage if you're on top. Even if you're on the bottom, if you're making them think about leg locks and ankle ankle locks and, and all this stuff, you're not mm. they're not gonna be throwing punches at your face. So right. again, you're you're rolling into your side of the realm, you know, and forcing them to play a different game, just like we did with Jose uh, Rosenstruck and Blades. Yep. You got a guy who not necessarily is great on the feet. You got another guy who's not necessarily great on the ground. It might suck to fans, but laying on somebody is a lot better than getting punched yeah. in the face and 100%. knocked out in thirty seconds. And he's not you know, a layer so, in prayer anyway, man. And he, he's you not. Ne you never so see you never better. see anyone boo or take it when he has top position. They're they're just at the edge of their seat to see what kind of they're, slick ass submission is going to come next. Exactly. Yeah. So that's why it's like I, mm -hmm. I just. I hope because he said, you know, I got a new camp after the last fight, da 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 da, and I'm like, I I just hope they're not trying to make you the same thing as the other camp was, mm. which is, and I understand, hey, you got to be a better striker, but again, don't lose track of who you are. Don't, you know, because right now, who is T City? Nobody knows who Brian T City is because he doesn't do triangles no more. Why? Because he's never in the situation. Why? Mm. Because he doesn't take people down. He only takes them down when they're on him, not when he goes. So it's just. Right. Very difficult to watch. I don't want to see him fight again unless he's, you know, changing his game up. So, yeah. All right. Hey, well said. We're gonna we'll, we'll finish with that, and then we're gonna start with our next subject matter. My personal favorite, Rob. I bring you <laughs> to shame, or not to shame. 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 Okay, Rob, to shame or not to shame. No sound on that. We'll get it on the edit, I guess. Um, I don't know what the hell's wrong. Rob, to shame or not to shame. The referees have been um, flagging people for um, unsportsmanlike conduct for taunting. It's, it's been an increasing uh, value in the, in the first three weeks that's hitting a trend that's, gonna set, that's probably going to break the record for most penalties for that. I'm going to give you the floor. Sorry, let's go here. Let's pause that. Let's get our clock. Sorry, buddy. And let's do that. So, to shame or not to shame, the, the increased amount of flagging for taunting. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> yes, I'd have to say it, it, it's, it's shame, but uh, there's a lot of bad things going on when, when you're talking about not just the referees, but what they're being enticed to call, um, how the game is getting very touch and go, um, the type of calls that they're calling on, on on quarterbacks where, you know, they're stopping the game before, you know, the quarterback has a chance to make a mistake even. Um, you know, I get the whole idea about forward progress and trying to prevent injuries, but at a certain point, football players sign up to put their lives on the line or their bodies on the line to win a game. So, I, I just hope that the rules start to reverse back a little bit. I have it in baseball a long time ago. Um, it's keep, it continues to happen in baseball, but, you know, rules change, and then they kind of get redacted, um, and, and they kind of, you know, find a way of smoothing out. But they, uh, football has been pretty terrible on how they, they've been uh, trying to change and, and, and figure out new ways to make the game 
maybe exciting or maybe you know more safe but right uh, the safety i believe is not in the in the legs or in the, the feet or it's in it's in the head right you know it's in the concussion so i like the targeting i like the you know the the no head shots i like the no vertical diving to hit somebody you know back shots no you know stuff like that but uh, you know, I can't. I, I don't like this whole everything that happens behind the offensive line. You know, right. Everything that happens with the quarterback, and you know, they don't call hold, but they'll call somebody. You know, falling over into the quarterback's legs, like that's just pretty Rid- outrageous ridiculous so. stuff. Okay. Yeah. So, all right. So, Rob, you covered you covered excessive flagging for for physical things. I'll, I'll cover the the category of taunting. Taunting basically. Um, when you're you're doing something to show up a player, um, you you there's an excessive celebration, which I'm actually okay because you work so hard just to get into the end zones. You can, I mean, there's these emotions that we expect these elite athletes to control, and I like the celebration. I like the fun bunch. I like these team celebrations in the end, and I don't think that those kind of celebrations qualify as taunting as far as showing teams up. But when someone gets a sack and you stand over them, or you're following someone around and you and you put hands in their face and you start talking stuff all personal and stuff like that. Um, that's not something I'm a big fan of. I think those little small plays where you, you know, you maybe you get a little stare down and that's okay. And I think the referees are doing a, a really good job and they're setting a precedent for that. And it's not going to change the game because the, the the referees have set set rules all the time and the players have found ways to adapt. And I, I'm optimistic, if not hopeful, that they're going to adapt to this because to quote Sam Jackson from Coach Carter, since winning is not a, since when the hell is winning not enough? You you get you got you got to do that to the team too. I, I mean, I like celebrations. I like team celebrations where they they keep it about each other. But this whole thing where you're getting in someone's face and while they're walking away, you're walking with them and talking all that nonsense. That's that is the beginning of the escalation of these these little team fights that lead to more unsportsmanlike penalties when the referee could have shut that that edge down from the beginning. Something that we as fans uh, and, and even coaches are like, dude, you, you need to nip this at the bud now and now that they're doing it, um, right? We, can, we, we can't have it both ways. We, get, we, gotta take the, we gotta take the good with the bad on that. Thoughts? Yeah, I yeah. agree. Cool. All right, hey, so the next topic, <laughs> we have no sound, but I promise we're going to fix that on an edit because we didn't even get my horn. We didn't hear my horn, dude. Um, no, I know. Next topic is quick question. Quick question. Okay, quick question. Is Aaron Rodgers back? Did he ever leave? The answer is yes, never left. I'm with you on that. Six touchdowns, no interceptions the last two games. Um, quick question. Rams beat the Bucks. Was that bad Bucks or good Rams? Uh, I know it's a little of both, but if you had to lean which side of the middle? I just say it's good Rams. I say good Rams. Hey, Brady did well, 432 yards. I mean, rush touchdown, yeah. to first down pass. Stafford. Stafford was the only missing piece, it seems like, huh? 348 yards, four touchdowns. Um, all right, quick question. This is hard for some of our East Coast people. I'll go first on this one. Should Ben Roethlisberger be benched? And the answer is, under any circumstances, yes. But as to the question, benched for who? Nobody. It's his last year. You gotta. The guy has earned the right to fall on his sword, but beyond this year... You have to have a game plan. Pittsburgh has not had a game plan, and this is why you can't bench him for anyone. They haven't, right? They haven't planned around his retirement. Oh, quick! So I mean, should he be benched like, or not? Like you said, for who? And they <laughs> should have done this five years ago. Five years ago, when he was sorry to make this quick question, but when he was barely getting on the field five years ago, and they had Le'Veon Bell, who we don't know what's going on. That's when you get a quarterback. You know, not a stopgap quarterback, a quarterback of the future. And then you have four quarterbacks last last draft, and you can't draft one of them, mm-hmm. not one of them. It's just crazy to me, man. Like they they've been asking for bad uh, bad seasons for a very long time, and if they didn't get J.J. Watt two three years ago, they would have been a failing franchise. It would have been I worse than that, right? That. Yeah, guarantee you that. How the hell? I don't care about Devin Bush. I don't care about Fitzpatrick. Exactly. I don't Thank care you. about any of these guys. If you didn't have T.J. Watt. They would not be a double-digit win team, guaranteed. Agreed. Guaranteed. I'll think about it too. The worst team, the worst season Tomlin's ever had was eight and eight. Man, that's not hell, dude. But the guy, 
he's he's a good coach, not a miracle worker. And like you said, they're they're this is this this has got to be the the lesson learning season, and and the next season is going to be like that too because they haven't had a they haven't developed a contingency plan. So mm-hmm. and there's no one on the college scene that's going to be a first year impact, you know. So Trevor Lawrence was that guy, and then and you know someone else got him. Quick question, Rob. Uh, ben Simmons does not intend to play with the Sixers again. Do the Sixers even want him back? <laughs> I mean, yeah, because you, you don't want to, you can't create a championship team. You know, you have one, you got to keep it. But at the end of the day, he's creating a lot more headaches than not. Um, and they should have done a lot more a long time ago with his shooting and not put all the pressure on. Just because they're winning now, he needs to be a better shooter. You know, that's bad development for a very long time. When does well? I say no. If he, I mean, he doesn't want back. I'm like, bye. Okay, we're the number the number one seed last year, but when push came to shove, when tensions are high and butt cheeks got tight, and we needed you to hit free throws, a point guard at that. You know, I'm oh, you're this dominant player, but but yet you 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 go to the line. There's no one playing defense. No one could block your ball. There's little to no time limit, even though there is to just to hit to put a ball in the hoop from a relative distance, and you can't put that ball in the hoop. That is the coach's responsibility. But when the hell? When the hell does he as a professional take accountability for that? You know, when the hell does oh, do, do okay, him and the coaches okay. get together and, and whatever? This is this is as an extended quick question. Sorry. But let me tell you, let me ask you this though. Mm-hmm. Um when you see a six eight athlete who can dribble the ball like crazy, dunking the ball down the field, mm-hmm. you know, and every single little aspect, and like, oh, but he can't shoot, you know? Oh, okay. Where's the coach who's stepping in saying you need a free throw? You know what I mean? Like, come on, let's talk. Stop talking about jump shots. Like you said, free throws. That is sure it's on a player, but let's look. Let's go back and like, because it doesn't happen right now. It happens in his past. Where are the coaches telling him the free throw? You know what I'm saying? Where are where's LSU telling him hit your free throws? You know where's the first five years of his professional career? Everybody talking about his free throws. No, it's oh you don't want to shoot a three point shot. That's what everybody talked about for the first five years is that he didn't want to shoot a free not that he didn't want to shoot free throws, not that he couldn't shoot free throws, not that he couldn't shoot mid-range, is that he couldn't hit threes. So when we're talking about all this, we need to take a step back and be like, but where were we in his development? You know, I get that we all have to be players, but then, you know, every every single player was was amazing at hitting free throws and now now they're even better. It's Mm -hmm. not like that. You know, Rondo was bad at a certain time. For his whole career, he got better hitting free throws. It's about the development of that player. And Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but if you invest that type of money, you put that time in for that player. Yep. And I don't believe that they – I think that they forced him to do things that he didn't want to do, which is shoot the ball when he knew that he wasn't going to make it. So he's playing better basketball even at that time. And they're just, you know, basically scapegoating him for all their wrongs. Their big man can't stay on the floor. The rest of their team is trash. Like they have a couple of decent pieces. He's the only guy there that has talent enough outside of Embiid to create a championship team. So, yeah, I think they failed him. I don't think he should ever go back. But, yes, he does need to have accountability because he still needs to make a jump shot. But, uh, yeah, yeah but day, I mean, they failed him. But, and you're right. Look, you make it all the way to the pros from high school, from college, or whatever – and you're trying to tell me out of all of these coaches, these coaches, like Rob, these aren't guys who are part-time coaches, all right? These They're not waiting tables at night and, and doing, you know, doing what they love to do for the fun of the game. No, these are professional coaches. They get paid six figures, sometimes seven-figure salaries, and it is their only freaking job. To quote Loki from, uh, uh, from Thor Ragnarok, you had this one job, just the one, all right? Now, with that being said, if that's their job, I kind of refuse to believe that they're not trying they didn't try to take care of the one and i think this i think simmons doesn't get to claim obliviousness all the, from the high school to the college and all of this time or whatever doesn't get to claim a player obliviousness to why he can't shoot free throws that's bull. i mean you're I right no you're right yeah. at the end of the day when when they lose and he can't do it it's the coach you know, but I really, nah, I'm I really, know. really leery about giving giving these these dudes all the praise. Nobody praises the coach when he, when his technical jump shot or when his, his ability to play defense is good. Uh, it's it's all it's always someone else's fault when he can't perform. And I'm not, I I, I mean, me and you, we're definitely gonna disagree on that. They're gonna have to miss me on that one. I mean, because only because of where he is in his NBA career. Mm-hmm. If if he's a rookie, yeah, 
Fine, give him a pass. Second year player, eh, yeah, fine. I mean, third year player, now you got Doc River and zero excuses. Come on, when the hell does this guy, I, I, when, I his, when the hell does this guy say, I, I, I think I need to hit I some disagree. free throws? I just disagree. Yeah, of course. We could say the same thing about uh, every single big guy that's been in this league. Yeah. Right? Yep. Is it because they can't shoot a free throw? Or is it because coaches don't care about their shooting or care about their rebounding and how they have outlet passes and how they box people out? And how they are during a free throw, they got to box every single person out and know their defensive assignments. It's I feel like when Ben Simmons is a six six lefty coming in the gym, people expect things of him. Right. They expect him to put a ball in the hoop because he's tall enough, because he's a lefty, because he's just that good. So when you've had that ability for such a long time, I feel like people, if they either one have never been to that level, because that's a lot of coaches, yep. or two haven't trained people at that level. They take a step back and say, well, this guy must know it because he's that good. And that happens in every single sport. And, and, and it happens not, in the best coaches, too. Do you think? It absolutely. Ha- yeah. I mean, you got Do- you got Doc Rivers but, there now, man. But he's not a he's not a he's not a technical coach. He's an X's and O's guy. He's a you be here. You do this. You do your job. And then right. I'll be the coach. Right. He's not a hey, we need to get better at a skill. That's not his coaching. Yeah. So, like, again, you got to take it within reason. Let's go back to the guy who was there before, Brett Brown. He's not a technical guy. Hmm. He's a X's and O, you play here, you do this, and then we'll win games. It's not a, you got to break it down, I'm going to get you better as an individual, and then we're going to move forward as a player. Because that's what his job was coming in there, Brett Brown. And Doc Rivers, his job is the exact different. His job is not to be technical. His job is to win championships because they think they have the pieces there. So, again, bad development on a player that needs the development. You, it's like it's like saying, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draft Zach Wilson, but I expect, I expect Patrick Mahomes out of him. That's wild. <laughs> and then I expect it for five years. And if you don't sh- show up as Patrick Mahomes for five years, it's your fault. Right. Right? Mm-hmm. How do I become Patrick Mahomes? You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? It's like it's either I have the skill and then I just have to reach that potential or I'm there and I'm not executing. Both of those reasons are the mm. coach's fault. Rob, keep it McLean. Congratulations. We got a debate in the middle, a quick question. Yes, we do. And I, yes, I'd like do. to say that somewhere between um, hitting free throws like Drummond and hitting every damn free throw like Steph Curry is this gray area where we ain't asking him to be Curry. Mm. We, just want, we, just want him to, we just want him to shoot like a mammal. <laughs> a professional player that Drummond. drinks water and walks on two legs for a point guard position. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but again, that's that you can't say just because he's a point guard means he should be making his free throws because right. that's the fallacy yeah. is that the mm. point guard's supposed to be the small guy and right. the small guy is supposed to have the skills and mm-hmm. the big guy doesn't have to have the skills because he's got the height so it's, he might miss free throws. And that falls that's on coaching. That's a fallacy. That yeah, definitely well, it's a fallacy it falls on position but yeah. also coaching like yeah, everybody that's... should be skillful. Everybody should yeah. be this but if they're not, you should probably have to put in a little extra time. It's just I think it's just I agree. everybody just wants everything right now, especially coaches, because that's the players that they have. So nah. it's just let's get Ben Simmons on a team where they utilize him as opposed to tell him he has to be a certain player. I'd that's like to I'm see saying. him play small forward. I think as a small forward, he can bring the ball up on the court like a point guard anyway, very much like LeBron James and very much like uh, uh, Magic Johnson, who, who was like a two or three three position player, even though he was a point guard. I'd, I'd like to see, like you said, take the man's strengths and and, and utilize them. But at the same time, man, we he's got – and, and that guy, that guy can kiss any ring goodbye, man. If he wants to be on the court at the end of a game when it counts the most, man, dude. And 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 like you said, it is a, at the end of the day, it is a coach's responsibility. But at some point, when is it not? Is it is it never? You know, uh, uh, I mean, that's I guess that's the question. Rob, very very so good what, point. What, but what I'm asking uh-huh. you then is, you think he's not? You think he's not doing it at all? No, I think he's trying. He's I think I think like you okay. said. So I think I think that's where you both. win this debate. No, but, but I think that's both, where you, you know win this saying? debate. He is trying, but right. there's there's someone tech tech technique wise that's not um, allowing him to either a conquer the the, the the muscles between his ears and b uh, just have this muscle memory where they all go no. in. No, no. Right. If you watch him shoot, he can't shoot. <laughs> that's just it. <laughs> so you need to recognize that as a coach. You can't be throwing the ball to the left while you're shooting. That's it. 
That's not a hard fix. We're all watching the same shit here. I'm sorry, but that's just what it is. I'm not going to let that go off. That's not that's not hard. It's not. Uh, <laughs> not hard. Um, <laughs> Rob, quick question. <laughs> Nah, hey, no, super necessary, and I'm glad we could. Dude, we got all the NBA we needed in this one, that one subject matter, which, by the way, should have been a topic. So I think I'm gonna take, I'm, I think I'm gonna take the L on that one, at least on that level. Uh, quick question, Rob. Um, you actually, we did the Tucker 66 record breaking field goal. Was that a great Ravens comeback, or did you feel bad for the Lions? Felt bad for the Lions. Me I mean, too. it was a great comeback, but man, oh, uh, at the end of the bad. day, my heart just broke for the Lions. And I and Tucker, I picked for I I have him for every fantasy team. I have I play in like two leagues a year, and at least in one of my leagues, I got Tucker as one of my kickers because he's Mister he's Captain Clutch. Um, mm-hmm. All right, so quick question: We're gonna go to three events on US, UFC Fight Night. The main. Let's start with the main one: Johnny Walker against Tiago Santos. Whoa, mm-hmm. whoa. I mean. I'll go. I'm probably going to go with Johnny Walker in this one. I feel like he's kind of come out of out of the woodworks. Um, Tiago still kind of up in the air. Mm-hmm. Um, I still don't know health wise how how he's going to um, pop out, but you know I, I'm going to go with Johnny Walker in this one. I like the young kid. I think I'm going to go Johnny Walker too. Kevin Hollis against Cal Duc- Duc- Ducas. Um, I like Kevin. I think I'm going to go with Holland on this one just because I think he'll he'll come back and fight the way he's supposed to fight. I root for Kevin, but I'm giving Kyle the rub on this one. He's on. He's been on a tear. Alex Cowboy Oliveira versus Nico Price. Whoa. Yeah, Nico dude. Price on this one, I believe. Dude, That's this is going to be badass, dude. I give it to Cowboy Oliveira. I think Nico Price is going to run into something that – um. Um, yeah, that's something that he's, he, he thinks he can, his chin can take, but can't. And that's it. We got circling off against Jocko, Aspen Ladd, but we're not going to pick those. We'll talk about some of those matches if they stick out next week. Um, all right, that's it for a quick question. Uh, but before we go, I don't really have any shout outs. I got a shout out to, um, you know, I mean, if we want to talk about volleyball at all, uh, we were talking about Mike Cavatillo. Mm-hmm. Um, he's going to come on the podcast later this week. Um, one of the most improved players, just this guy from New York. So want to learn the game, got got good, is getting better. So big up to him on a, on a different level because volleyball, there are levels to this. And then this validation game where people are labeling this guy, AAA, this guy, the mid-level open and this and that. I'm not labeling. I'm just talking about a volleyball player just getting it in. And um, you guys tune in this Friday. Um, we're um, at 2.30. It's going to be on the Option Podcast, episode 113. All right. I'm also um, going to have, we're going to also talk about um, uh, PTSD for veterans. And we're going to talk about how, how to get veterans better, benef- be- better benefits and how to get these guys in the medical and, and care and educational care and dental care and all the stuff they need. I have um, Mary Beth Rose Gingrich, PhD. Um, she is... She her job. She has a clinic where she she works with patients that are diagnosed with that's um, from a psycho a psycho analytical phase. And she also has a, a a hotline. She's a military contractor that has a crisis hotline for active duty veterans if they're feeling suicidal or stressed out. She she basically from midnight to eight in the morning. She's on call for those guys. And she was also um, she also did a two, a two tours in Afghanistan. She's an Afghan vet. So. Um, that's episode 114, and it's not a human being more qualified. As far as like, is this person qualified? I want to talk to some experts. Rob, is there, there's no one more qualified than this young lady who's going to come on the podcast either, um, probably most likely next week. Um, and that's it. That's all I got. Big shout out to Mike and get ready for what's coming. Rob, is there anything you'd like to say to the American people, if not the world population today? Be happy, be healthy, y'all. Be happy, be healthy. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> all right rob well rob loves you guys okay but me no nah, i think i love you guys too man turned out to be a great weekend you know it's, i hope we have another great weekend this week um got some uh i think the cincinnati Bengals playing on thursday night i don't know against who i don't care but i've been rooting for for, uh, uh, for joe burrow and for all of you at home for all of you watching this man thank you so much this that's my man rob keep it mclean mclean i'm jason debiss this is episode 72 of Sports Debate Tuesday, and Rob, we're out. 
Come check out the Option Podcast on OptionDB.com. It's also available on iTunes and Spotify and on YouTube under the NY Varsity Sports Handle. You're going to love what you hear.